Thanks so much, Rick. Cheers for that. He's so right about these words being so important. Um, and they're such a challenge. Well, at least I found them such a challenge. And I hope and pray that this morning we'll find them such a challenge. Um, because as, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching of Jesus, uh, we've come across so many different things that have been, I guess, a, a challenge to us. So that Jesus takes the traditional teachings known of the day and he kind of twists them on their head and he, he brings that kingdom perspective, the God's eye view onto what people thought they knew and what they thought they understood. He said, yes, but it's really like this. You know, how many times he said, oh, well, you've heard it said, or you've heard it said, and yet I tell you, when Jesus continued to look to the heart, the, the root cause of issues and problems, rather than just the superficial surface level of things, and said, this is where you need transformation, at the heart of things. And so as we've been going through these three chapters, five, six, and seven in Matthew's gospel, and been learning about this teaching of the kingdom of God, this Sermon on the Mount, we've had so many challenges. And in this final section, he offers the final challenge. And if you hear last week, the recap from when Lockie and I shared the messages, Jesus talked about a bunch of twos, as in the number, like two. You've got two different things. You've got, you've got two pathways you can choose from. There's a narrow path. There's a, a small gate. You can choose that one. It's going to be hard, but it's going to lead to life. Or you can choose the broad road. There's a broad gate. You could go through that. Heaps of people on that, but it's going to lead to destruction. You've got two, two choices. You've got two choices of who you're going to be listening to in your teaching. There are false prophets that are producing bad fruit. Or you can eat good fruit. Well, you can be a true disciple or a false disciple. There are those who are going to say, oh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all the right stuff? But only those who were doing the will of the Father in heaven, who had truly had that heart transformation, that heart change that Jesus has been speaking about all throughout this Sermon on the Mount. It's only those who will enter into the kingdom of God. We have these two choices all the way along, and then Jesus in this final section says, so there are two choices of the foundations of your life and how you're going to live in this. It's kind of like a summary about everything that he's been speaking about. There's a, there's a solid rock that you could build your life upon or there's the sinking sand that you can build your life upon. You've got two choices again. And what I want to draw our attention to, uh, well, after I'll give you an overview I should do that first because otherwise the slides are going to be in very bad order. As we go through this, I don't have anything profound to offer when it comes to this, this story, this message, this section of Jesus' teaching because it's so clear. But I want us to focus again just a little bit and remind ourselves of who Jesus is as the teacher and his teaching that in this challenge, there is going to be a difference that we find between hearing and doing. And he's not going to shy away from saying it's going to be hard, that life is hard. But then we've got these options of how we want to build our life and what we're going to build our life upon. So I want us to be reminded a little bit about what, what was at the very end of this passage here? This is the last part of chapter 7. And it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, if you've got your apps, you've got your Bibles, you might go back to chapter 5. As a really, really terrible preacher and pastor, I didn't bring my actual Bible up in here. I've got on my notes here, but anyway... If you flick back to chapter 5, look, because I know it all in here, actually, Joe, it's fine. That, that was a joke, I don't really. Um, but I do know that at the beginning of chapter 5, in verses 1, just into, into verse 2, it does speak how Jesus sees the crowds. He goes up onto the mountainside and up to the hill. And then the disciples come and they follow. And he starts to teach them. And it says, he began by saying to teach them. 
So we've got these top and tail moments of this Sermon on the Mount. The beginning of chapter 5 where it speaks about that setting and Jesus has gone up there. And hopefully all of us, like we expressed even at the beginning of the service, are like those pilgrim disciples. We see Jesus, he's up there, and and we're going to make that effort to come up and sit at the foot of the teacher. In a sense, at the beginning of chapter 5, I feel like they had an option. Jesus has gone up there, there's all these crowds, and they chose, no, I'm going to go and be with Jesus. I want to go and hear what he's going to have to say. And Jesus started teaching just the disciples, but as we can see, the progression of his teaching goes along. The crowds have also started to gather up as well. And as he began just sort of speaking to the disciples, he then starts to be, rather than just directly to them, he's more broadly speaking then to all the crowds that are around. And then by the end of chapter 7, at the end of his teaching, there's this remarkable thing that when he's finished speaking, the crowds are just amazed. Amazed at what he said. Because it, was, it wasn't like those in the synagogue that they'd been listening to or any of the other philosophers around and any other people who had tried to impart knowledge. He spoke as if he had some sort of authority. Paul reminded us of this Hebrew word, this shmika, this authority that was given, that he had. And again, I want us to be reminded of Jesus as our teacher. And whether or not we sit at the feet of Jesus, whether we decide to put ourselves in that space where we come up the mountain and we reach Jesus and we sit and we listen. And if because of perhaps uh, our, our background, perhaps we get so familiar, we've just forgotten to be amazed at Jesus. We've forgotten that when he speaks, he speaks words that are are life. That he's the greatest teacher who's ever walked the earth. That he's the greatest philosopher who's ever walked the earth. That he's the greatest mind that's ever walked the earth. That he can speak into our situation with the best understanding and clarity of what life is about and where we're at. These people on the mountain, these crowds started to get it, didn't they? There was something so unique and something that resonated with them when Jesus spoke. And I don't want us to take Jesus' words for granted, but I want us to all be challenged to be reminded of the importance of Jesus as our teacher. Perhaps for many of us, I don't know what age this happens but we start to buck up against the system of authority of people who are going to speak into our lives whether it's your teachers at school and you don't want to listen to them whether it's at your workplace you don't want to listen to them i don't know what it might be lecturers or in anywhere in lots of spheres (laughs) husbands and wife (laughs) but you see We've got, to, we've got to allow ourselves to be subtle and soft and have a change of heart in that. That kind of rebellion against an authority that sort of doesn't want to hear what others have to say. When it comes to Jesus, we've got to humble ourselves to that. We've got to get out of our own road. And we've got to sit at the feet of Jesus and go, I need you to teach me, Jesus. I need to give you the authority that you have to speak into my life. We get to recognise ourselves as apprentices to Jesus the Master and be willing and subtle and soft to be moulded and shaped by the teaching of Jesus and to ask for his help to do that. Because Jesus said... I'm the way. I'm the truth. Like you want to find a way of living, it's going to be the way of Jesus. You want to find truth in this life, it's going to be through Jesus. You want to find life, and life to the full, as he said in John 10.10, you're going to find it in Jesus. And it's not a hard 
bad thing because you know what jesus in only a few chapters later is going to invite people who are feeling the weariness and the burden of life and he's going to say come come to me you're desperate for rest you can't do this on your own and you're finding that out the hard way come walk beside me come take this yoke on you learn from me i'm gentle i'm humble in heart and you're going to find rest for your souls my yoke is e easy my burden is light and friends i don't know about you but my heart yearns for that And this isn't a fake promise. Jesus doesn't say things that he doesn't mean. He says, come. He invites us to come. Find rest for your souls and learn. Today, will you just take Jesus on as your teacher? Will you sit at his feet as an apprentice and just learn? Be willing to have him speak into your life. To be able to humbly and gently point out the things in your life that aren't right. The rocks that are on the road for you walking in that pathway of life that he says, I want to move those out. And you'll find life and you'll find rest. Jesus is amazing. We've got to be reminded of that. And his way is good. Last week I got to share with you about my friend who had walked away from the Lord, who had come back. And in this message, they'd said this to me, that it's been this five and a bit years and a huge spiritual and life journey. I've decided to follow Jesus again as an adult. I really think he's the best person to follow. I will lead the best life as a result. And I'd been messaging with this person and, and I wanted some permission to share who it was, but I hadn't heard back. And uh, throughout this week, I, I confirmed and my friend said, yeah, please share this with the church. Praise God. our beautiful friend Ginny who had spent some time walking away from God praise God that that prodigal daughter has come home and she passes on her love and thanks to this this church community for the years that she spent here and she mentioned like Sharon and George and Trevor and Ehab and Mandy and Pete and Soph and, and us as a church as we surrounded her and loved her. Oh, it's good news. And she's rediscovering that Jesus is the right way. And his way of life is worth living. And she's come to that challenge that there's a difference between just hearing and understanding but then obeying and doing as well and this is what jesus was speaking about right in this section where he says anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built the house on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice it's like a foolish man who built the house on the sand it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say in this moment that the foundation of this, um, of this analogy is himself. It's, he's not saying that salvation is the foundation to this. He's actually saying it's those who put into practice my teaching. Now let's get this right, and I hope this has been echoed through our Sermon on the Mount, that our works will not save us. Salvation is an instant thing when you come to Jesus 
when you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That it is a once-for-all transaction when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you repent of your own sins and know that it's only through Christ alone that you can be saved from your sins and enter into that relationship with the Father and walk in his kingdom. But Jesus says there is then a difference about how you live your lives and the foundation that your life will be lived on. And yes, Jesus, in another way, in another analogy, is the cornerstone, is our faith, is the rock. But in this circumstance, Jesus isn't saying, I am that foundation that you build on. He's saying, if you hear these words of mine and you put them into practice, then the life that you will live will have a foundation based on rock. If you hear these words of mine and you choose not to put them into practice, well, then the life that you will live will be on sinking, unstable sand. So he's not here talking about salvation. In other parts of the Sermon on the Mount, he did. Here he's talking about my teaching. Are you going to listen to my teaching? Are you going to follow my teaching? If you want to tick your preacher's bingo card today, Dallas Willard, here we go. I'm going to quote him again. And I think I've said this before anyway, that Dallas has said that grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. If you think you can earn God's favour and earn God's grace and salvation, you're in the wrong track. But we can provide effort. We can work out our salvation. As Paul so poignantly puts it in Philippians here, we're going to be doing a series on Philippians towards the end of this year just to put that out there. He says this to the church, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The life of salvation, the way of salvation, is a lifestyle based on the teachings of Jesus and our obedience to that. And we're not obedient because we have some sort of mean, cruel task master that is like ticking off a checkbox list to say, what have you done? Are you a good or a bad person? It's a response to our salvation. And a response to seeing who Jesus is and that he is a teacher who has taught us the way to live that we would then work out our lives in the way of salvation. But this is important as well, and we're going to touch into this, for it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. Now just, it's God who works in you. Take that, just Place it in the side for a second, put it on a shelf. We're going to come back to that thought in our final point. Jesus said about his disciples, uh, no, sorry, I should say that John said, um, 1 John, we know we've come to know him, Jesus, if we keep his commands. But there's proof in the pudding if you've engaged in a relationship with Jesus, if you put your trust in him, that whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do the commands, that they're a liar. The truth is not in that person, but anyone who obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we're in him, that whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. There is something unique about living out the way of Jesus, this symbolic relationship with God that his love is made complete in us as we are living out in obedience and in fellowship with Jesus. 
And if you claim that you're someone who follows Jesus, look at that last verse. If you claim to live in him, well, you must live as Jesus did. In fact, the, the Greek word in that is walk as Jesus did. Like, you've got to walk that walk. That's why I like the word fellowship, as well as discipleship. I don't want to take that out of the vernacular, but our fellowship. How are we going in following our master? You claim to live in him. You walk, not only with him, but in the footsteps of Jesus. And we recognise that life's hard. Jesus said that. He said there's stuff going to happen in life. There's going to be the rain. There's going to be the streams rising, the winds blowing that's going to beat against the house, right? And it's exactly the same. He says this for the person who builds their house on the teaching of Jesus, on the solid foundation of the rock, or for the person who doesn't want to do the listening and fails to follow and build their house on rock but builds it on sand instead, their own philosophical best ideas. Exactly the same verse words are used for both. Rain's going to come down, streams are going to rise, winds are going to blow and beat against the house. It's a recognition, isn't it? And Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, he had a couple of analogies, he said, well, if you want to follow me, it's like a, a king who thinks about when they're going out to war and they've got to weigh up whether or not they're going to be able to achieve the goal of winning against the opposition. And they're like, okay, let me think about it. Let me count the costs. Or if we're going to find a builder who's going to build a tower, they've got to think about, do I have the resources, the finances, do I have the materials to be able to do that? Or am I just going to start building and then give it up or not have enough and be an embarrassment? Jesus said, you've got to count the cost. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said to his disciples. Please don't ever get the picture that following Jesus, that being a Christian is going to be all roses and skipping through green fields. And It's hard. We are fish that are going against the tide, aren't we? All this teaching of Jesus has been like that. When someone's going to strike your cheek, you're going to turn the other one. If someone's going to steal your coat, you're going to give them the tunic as well. This is absolutely bonkers in this world. It's not how it works. But Jesus says, yeah, well, that's the kingdom of God. He calls us to count the cost. He knows the things in life will happen. But he's inviting us to withstand the storms by following his teaching. Have a look at this.
how firm's your foundation? Because there are two foundations Jesus speaks to, doesn't he? One of the foundations is on the rock. And in that storms of life, it didn't fall. And the other foundation was sand and the house fell with a great crash. In that clip, it spoke about like finances and money as something we build our, finance, our, our foundations on. And often that's true. But often it's material things. Often it's just what we think is right and good and best. But Jesus says, I'm inviting you to know what's best. That it's not going to be anything that you can come up with. But listen to me. Learn from me. Trust in me. And I think that's one of the things that I'm really challenged with in this. Do I trust that Jesus will be enough, will be solid enough, that his teaching and his way of living will be right enough in this world that we find ourselves in? Prophetically, Isaiah spoke about the foundation that God brings. It says, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. It's saying that we can trust in this foundation. That no matter what life brings, the ups and the downs... And friends, we know there are downs. We know there are hard things that happen. But that we can put our trust in the foundation of Jesus and his teaching and his way. I have this, often we have this disconnect, I think, with the teaching of Jesus and thinking that, how will that work out today? Or we keep it at an arm's distance. Or perhaps... Perhaps we're, we're too prideful to really accept it. Maybe sometimes we're just a bit stubborn. Maybe we're actually afraid to really trust Jesus and take him at his word. Not truly believing that the way of Jesus is truly good and right. It was good in principle, but I don't know if that really applies in my situation today. And maybe we just don't want to give up our way of living, being seated on the throne ourselves instead of offering the throne of our heart to Jesus. Well, as Jesus continued to speak to the heart, this is a hard issue again. We need to examine our hearts and see. Because we're going to struggle to just, and this is where that passage in Philippians, it's God who wills in us, works in us to do his will. And this is where I want you to take that back off the bookshelf and bring it back in. Because we need to have that transformation in our hearts. That's something only God can truly do. Jeremiah this is what God said to his people. This is the covenant I'm going to make with the people of Israel after that time, in a future time. I'm going to put my law in their minds. I'm going to write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. It's not just an external thing, but God's going to do something that means that it's going to become an internal thing in our heart and our mind. In Ezekiel, the prophet, he said this through the Lord, that the Lord was going to sprinkle clean water on you. You're going to be cleansed, cleanse you from your impurities, from your idols, from all your sin. I'm going to give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you, remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Oh, 
we need heart transformation, a heart transplant. <laughs> and in God, we get it. That invitation, we get that heart transplant, that it can change the very will of our lives and the minds that we have can be transformed to have the mind of Christ and hearts that are transformed from hearts of stone and stubbornness and rebelliousness and pride for a heart of flesh that beats and pumps in rhythm with the heart of a loving God. He says, I'll do that. I'll wash you clean from your sin. And we see that through Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross. And we get his spirit poured out to us. And Jesus said this when he was at this last day of the great festival in John 7. He says, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Come, thirsty brothers and sisters, come to Jesus and drink from his living water and receive afresh and anew that heart of flesh and the spirit that can flow from within us that equips us, that enables us to be able to live the way and the truth and the life. We've just got to sit in that challenge and make a decision, don't we? And so I... I want us just to spend some time again through adoration and worship, reflecting on that challenge and doing business with God, as they say. You might find that you've come this morning with hearts of stone and you need a heart of flesh. You might come this morning and the storms of life are coming in on you and you know that you've got a foundation of sand and it's sinking. You might come weary and tired. And all of these things are answered by Jesus, who invites us in. He says, I'll give you a hope and a future. I'll give you the foundation. I'll give you a way of living. I'll give you rest for your weary soul. I will replace your heart of stone and replace it with flesh. I will wash you clean. We're going to sing two songs just to close. And during this time, make it just prayerful for you. Make it responsive for you. Spend this time with God responding to the challenge of which foundation you want to build your life on.